Oh, it looks like it's, you know, maybe it's, I still have some time on it. I don't have a paid Zoom account and I record all of my podcast interviews in Zoom. Oh, so maybe I didn't even have to pay for it. They, I think it's just like if you have three or more people then and, and you need to go over 40 minutes, then you have to have a paid account. But otherwise, they're they're pretty flexible. Oh, okay. I mean, yeah, it just, yeah, I've been trying to cancel little things like that that I don't need. Um, Completely understand that. So, yeah, let me, so that at least it'll record in Zoom. And then uh, I want to try this other thing called Audio Hijack that I just got. Okay. And, oh, can you talk a little bit? I'm just going to adjust your volume. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, can you hear me okay? I have the microphone here, so just want to make sure that the sound quality is good on your end. Okay. Hello, hello, hello. Testing, testing, testing. Okay, that's... I don't know about this audio. Okay, that okay, that looks good. And awesome. I don't know why it just suddenly turned your volume down on, on my headphones, although I can see the, hmm. the level's good. Interesting. Not sure about that. Oh, I see why. It's going to be the okay. Okay, can you speak one more time? Yeah, how is this? Can you hear me better now? Perfect. Excellent. Okay. Yes. Yeah, some for some reason it's splitting us into. Um, maybe I should turn off the uh, audio hijack. <laughs> Let me just try that next time. So let's see. By the way, I'm really glad you and Tara Lynn got to connect. She was so excited about that. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't know. I I didn't really communicate with her after we. Um, after I published the podcast, because it took me a while to get the editing done, but I, I thought mm -hmm. it came out really good, and I had some really good feedback. A lot of people have yeah. been writing to She's me. She's very it. happy about that one. So, oh, that's awesome, great. awesome. That's great. So, yeah, welcome to the Rehab Podcast. Thank you for having me here today. It's an honor. Oh, thank you. And so, yeah, tell me about. Uh, and, oh, just to let you know, I'm going to edit this really closely, just like I do all my podcasts, so we can. Okay. But anything can be cut out or changed or whatever. Sounds good. So, um, yeah. So, tell me about your your publishing. Are, are you are you a publisher or a press agent? So I am a best-selling author. Uh, I am also a publicist, which really came about because I needed to learn how to publicize my own work and my books better. And I've been doing marketing for the last 15 years and publicity was a very natural transition for me. Well, that, and that, that makes sense, which I've learned also in the last few years. I, I completely changed my practice maybe five years ago and learned that the most important thing I need to learn how to do is marketing. And yes, absolutely. And especially for individuals, entrepreneurs, authors, knowing how to get the message out in a cost effective way is extremely important. So I'm really drawn to helping other entrepreneurs and authors help share their message, especially when it pertains to health, wellness and making the world a better place. So you're a publicist and a best selling author. Yes, uh, that's correct. So, so and, and you have uh, two books out. Actually, one book uh, on your website. I saw there's you have one book out and another book coming next year. Yes, that is correct. Oh, tell me about the the book that's coming up. So the book that's coming out on January fifth is called The Soul of Purpose, and it's really looking at the connections between purpose, spirituality, and health and well-being. So the book is looking at mental and emotional health as a platform for physical health. The thing that is really exciting to me about the book is because I was able to share my journey of overcoming fibromyalgia naturally after allopathic medicine failed to be able to help me. So just through simple things that people can do on a day-to-day -day basis, being able to go from being completely debilitated to 100% healed and recovered. Oh, yeah, and I, I remember when I was a, a resident, I think back in the 90s, that doctors would debate whether fibromyalgia was even a real condition or not. Yes, and that's very true. And when I was diagnosed, it was in the mid-2000s, and there's still 
weren't a lot of great treatment options. I still don't think there's a ton of great treatment options for fibromyalgia, but what we do know is that the mental and emotional health, as long as you are really working with that, if you're really working with diet and exercise, that can be a very strong platform for recovery. I mean, when I got sick with fibromyalgia, I left my career as a research scientist and completely pivoted everything I was doing. Yeah, now, as far as um, spirituality, uh, you know, patient, when I talk to patients about it and, and I try to bring information to them, you know, through podcast interviews and, you know, things that I've learned, uh, it, it, it's easy to talk about. You know, for example, we had a guest on who talked about the three principles, which is really interesting about how thought is, everything is, comes back to thought. You know, it's our thoughts that cause all of our problems and shape our world. And, and if we can kind of get past, you know, the, the thoughts in our brain and connect more with the universal mind that, you know, our, our problems will be resolved. And that's easy to say, but, you know, patients want to know, you know, when they're suffering, you know, my patients suffering from addiction and withdrawal and, and cravings for drugs, you know, they want to know what, what is the next step? You know, mm -hmm. it's easy to, for you to say, you know, you're just sitting there in a chair saying, you know, it's all about your thoughts, but you know, how, how do you take that first step in spirituality? I, you know, I completely agree with you. And that is one of my biggest complaints about uh, a lot of the information that's out there about the connections of spirituality to health is that it's not tangible. It's not easily approachable. It seems like a very vague concept. So in my work, I really try to break it down in a simple and understandable way and give people actionable steps that they can take to move from where they're at now to keep taking steps to moving forward. So one of the big reasons that I think spirituality it is very profound for health and well-being is because, sorry, uh, Siri likes to kick in when I'm trying to talk on my computer. Um, one of the reasons that I think that spirituality is important for health and wellness is because of its connection to purpose and also how it impacts the mind. So whenever you have faith in something outside of yourself, like God, it it's like a wild card because it means when you have faith, the literal definition of faith is the absence of doubt. So it means that you believe anything is possible or that when you pray to God, when God is connected with you, that it's going to remove your obstacles completely. So that belief in and of itself is a very powerful tool for reshaping your mindset. Otherwise, if you don't feel like you've got this invincible advocate on your side, it's very, very difficult to make change. So again, like back to mindset a little bit, 70% of everything that a person thinks or does is not even conscious. It's subconscious or unconscious. So that's why it's so important to start reshaping your mindset in a healthy way so that those subconscious and unconscious thoughts and reaction patterns to life become habituated towards positivity and towards making the change that we want to make. Otherwise, all of our behaviors and our actions they just become habits and they're going to fuel our future behavior and our future thoughts. So when you can make small changes each and every day, you can start creating new habits and retraining your mind. Yeah, sometimes it's hard to imagine that something's possible and that, that's how I kind of relate to it, that I, there's things that I, 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 I th some things I think are inevitable. Like I, I know that I can do them and, and I, if I take certain steps, I can get there. And there's things that I can't even and I guess I don't have the mindset yet where, you know, if you, if you told me, uh, you know, you can, you can be a, a multimillionaire, I, I would tell you, I can't even imagine that. I, I don't even mm -hmm. know what that would feel like. And I, I just can't even imagine that that's even possible. You know, but if you told me, uh, you know, you, you may get two or three new patients this week. I'm like, well, maybe, maybe not, but it's definitely possible. I can imagine that. Um, if you say, you know, Absolutely. You can, so, I mean, I mean, there's like, so I guess that, that might be the, is that what mindset is about? You know, of, of if, if you can actually, you actually believe that, that something's possible or that you can achieve it? That's definitely a first step. You have to believe that something is possible in order to be able to achieve that goal. And when I work with people, I advocate very simple approaches and changes on a daily basis that are going to help fuel more positivity because the more happy you are, the more positive you are, the more apt you are to think that good things can come your way. So maybe that's something 
like meditation or mindfulness. Maybe it's something like adding dopamine or serotonin producing foods to your diet, which are going to help to elevate mood naturally. Maybe it's increasing prebiotics and probiotics in your diet, which also have a strong impact on mental health. I think that these are very practical things that we can all do to start taking that step forward so that we can cultivate a healthy mindset. We're removing those physical barriers, one, by taking action and creating new habits and also doing something directly to change the chemistry in the brain. Okay. And now you, you told me, you said that, um, you said that you were a research scientist in the past. Uh, what, what kind yes. of research scientist were you? I was a molecular biologist, uh, was doing immunology research. I worked both in academia and also in the pharmaceutical industry. And that's the time when I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia. I was having a real crisis of conscience of my own. I didn't believe that animal testing was the way forward. Yes, that is kind of inevitable when you're doing preclinical testing. So I needed to completely reshape my life in order to recover. And that's what I did. And do you, do you I'm sure you still find all, all the stuff going on now really interesting. I mean, as far as the, the immune system and, and COVID and the, the really unique way that the yes. uh, coronavirus interacts with the human body. I find it fascinating and I, I find it fascinating how it's creating this inflammatory response, especially in children. I really, really wish we would see more coming uh, out of mainstream medicine about the, the use of things like turmeric and ginger and other things that have natural anti-inflammatory properties as, as a way to help people and help prevent this. Uh, I, I mean, there's so many medicinal foods that, that we can be eating that have been scientifically shown that they can help prevent viruses and in particular respiratory viruses, things like onions and garlic, uh, even tea has antiviral properties. Why not promote this more as a way for people to stay healthy? Yeah, that, that makes sense. You don't hear much about people talking about nutrition and supplements and, you know, those kind of things. Uh, and and that, that would definitely be a, a good idea. Now, I've also heard it said, uh, I think by another past guest on the show, that that sugar is inflammatory. So uh, sugar can definitely be inflammatory, and it, it's also very. Uh, I would say it's a very challenging substance if you're dealing with addiction and recovery because it it can really trigger addictive behaviors in people. And so, whenever you're able to minimize processed sugar and replace it with something that's a little bit more natural, it, it's not going to have like that negative impact on the mind. Have you worked in, in, your, in your private practice as far as with, with coaching and counseling people? Uh, have you worked with people uh, with addiction that are trying to overcome an addiction? I have in terms of creating a healthy mindset. So a lot of times this deals with starting off with a platform uh, of simple meditation and breathing, things that are naturally going to start to slow down and change the mind and bring the body back into a place of self-healing. And this is what's also going to enable people to create new habits. So you have to start changing the way that you think and perceive the world again, before you believe that you're going to be able to change. But yes, diet is a huge part of that because what we eat, what we choose not to eat, th this is so important for cultivating willpower and positivity and changing the brain chemistry, which of course, as you know, has a strong role in addiction and recovery. Okay. Another interesting thing is that when people go try, people are trying to recover from addiction and overcome active addiction, and they go to a certain kind, certain recovery meetings, you know, twelve-step meetings, and they're expected to identify as being, for example, an alcoholic or an addict. And uh, yeah, I don't like that one, but yeah, it just that seems like you're programming a lot. Yeah, like it seems like you're programming your brain for for failure. I mean, to to identify repeatedly as as that that kind of a thing? I, I think it depends where a person is in the journey. I think at the beginning, it is necessary to acknowledge that, that you have a problem and it needs to be addressed, but to keep perpetuating that, yes, that just roots itself, it solidifies itself into the mind, into the subconscious mind that you have a problem and you are working on changing the problem. So I don't think that when you get to those later stages and phases psychologically of where you're at in this recovery process, I, I don't think it's as healthy to keep identifying yourself as an addict if you want to permanently uh, go beyond that and really change 
who you are and change your identity. Because the way that we identify ourselves, that is so huge for health and well-being. You, know, you can't think of yourself as being an addict or as being a sinner or as being less than if you want to feel worthy and full of purpose and have a fulfilled life. I just recently wrote an article about interventions and I was kind of exploring the idea of what should happen in an intervention, uh, you know, an intervention for addiction. Should we even call it an intervention? Uh, and, and how should it be approached? You know, what kind of professionals might be brought in as consultants, if any? And how should the family interact with the person that they're intervening with? Um, what, what do you imagine to be the perfect uh, kind of intervention in that situation? Wow, that is... That's a very powerful question. I think it really depends on the person involved. Uh, there's, there's spiritual ways that you, you could tackle that. I mean, even, even the Bible says the body uh, is the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? So we wanna take care of the physical body. What if we started treating the person like they were an aspect of God, an aspect of divinity? If you wanna think about it from that sense, again, not that you're a sinner, not that you're less than, but that you are this, amazing temple of greatness. And what is it going to take to, to help this person to realize that? I think if we're able to look at something from that mindset, that that is going to help. And maybe that means taking like that spiritual angle, coming uh, in with an aspect of prayer, coming in like with mental health counselors, but something that is reminding the person that you are great, you were born great, you are born with a very unique purpose and reason for being, and everything about you is so perfectly aligned to live your purpose. This is what people need to hear. They don't need to keep hearing the negative things or seeing the things that, that got them into this cycle or the spiral to begin with. You know, my, my mom was an addict. She was addicted to alcohol. She was addicted to drugs. She was addicted to prescription methadone she was taking for pain. And it killed her when I was 19 years old. I never knew my dad very much because he was also an addict and he spent many years in prison because he was a criminal. So uh, I know from living with it, from seeing it, from uh, just going through what I had to endure, you know, because of growing up in that sort of environment, people don't tend to feel like they're good enough. So what can we do to help people feel like that they're good enough and they, they are worthy of being here and that they can make a difference in the world? I think everything comes back to service uh, or save us. Some people use that word. If you feel you have something to give, then you, uh, you're, start, you're going to start feeling your own inner light coming out and you're gonna feel like you can make a difference in other people's lives. That's essential if you wanna change your mindset. Okay. And, and I think I, I completely agree with you about, about interventions that, I mean, the way that some people imagine an intervention should be if basically the family gathers around and beats up on the person and says, you know, you need help, you know, you have a problem. Uh, we need to figure out what to do with you. Maybe we're going to kick you out of the house or take things away. To me, that seems like the complete wrong way to do it. Um, you know, and I'm, I can imagine people are angry and, uh, you know, they want to take out their anger, but that's definitely not the way to help a person with a problem. Um, no, it's just going to make them feel worse and dig in their heels even further. So what can you do to empower them and support them to succeed as opposed to telling them, hey, you're bad, you have a problem. Like, what do you need from me in order to be successful? What is it that you're lacking? Every bit of addiction, every bit of fear, uh, every bit of psychological negativity comes from some feeling of lacking something. So it's a matter of identifying what that is and helping people to fill that in. Some people, maybe they feel they don't have a great relationship or they haven't found the right person for them. I mean, ultimately we know happiness comes from within, but what can you do to help someone get to the point that they need to be at? There's always services out there. There's people that people can talk to for different sorts of issues. Maybe it, it truly does come down to diet, what people are eating, what they're not eating. Uh, we know that mental health has a very strong physical component and component, component to diet, you know, neurotransmitters and the gut brain axis with pre and probiotics. So just looking at this and identifying this, we can do so much to help people that we don't even realize. I, as a physician, you already know the World Health Organization says nearly 90% of disease is lifestyle related. So that's not something doctors have direct control over because they cannot dictate behavior in people. But what can we do to encourage a more healthy and productive lifestyle for people? 
that's something that everybody can do. So if you're going to stage an intervention, I would think about it that way. What can you do to provide support? Uh, what can you do to make this person feel that they are worthwhile and that they are worthy of great things? Yeah, now, a person in that situation might even feel that that they have no control, that they're completely you know, under the effects of, of drugs and addiction or they're, they're maybe they're in a life situation where they have no control of, over their own life. Now, and you've written about that, about free will and where you have free will and don't have free will and how you can kind of navigate through life uh, using your free will. And uh, I, I thought it was a really good article. I, there was like a four quadrant diagram. Yeah, thank you. Drawn. And it, yeah, it's really, really interesting. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that, about free will and karma and, and those? I, I, there was like a couple other things in there that I... Yeah, absolutely. I, I really believe that destiny and fate are a spectrum. I, th I think that most things in life are on a spectrum. So I would define destiny as the best possible outcomes of anything in your life and fate as the most negative possible outcomes of anything in your life. And where you are is somewhere on that spectrum because we all make good choices, we all make bad cho choices. So free will and karma come into that because we all ultimately have choice how we choose to react or respond to a situation but you don't get to choose what happens to you in life so these certain things like those are those karmic aspects to come to you but you have total free will as to how you choose to react or respond to that situation i really hope that people choose to respond which means being conscious about it uh, being clear and not going into like reactive patterns, which come from the subconscious or unconscious minds. So whenever you can choose to respond to a situation, you're probably going to have a, a better outcome. But the better decisions that you make, the more that you understand how your past has impacted your present, you can make decisions right here and now, which are going to impact your future and help to take you in the direction that you want to go. So that's the role that I think that free will plays in it. You don't get to choose what happens to you, but you get to choose how you respond. And every situation, everything that happens to you, no matter how good or how bad, is an opportunity for you to learn and to grow and to move towards your destiny. I firmly believe that. I believe that God gives us everything that we need to succeed. And oftentimes that comes in the form of challenges and obstacles so that you know what you're capable of. Yeah, I think about that a lot as far as when you say challenges and obstacles, you know, instead of, instead of saying the word problem, you know, finding other words for it, you know, which is really useful to, to not feel like you're stuck with a problem that you can overcome it, an obstacle. Absolutely. I, I mean, think about it this way. Uh, we all have to deal with stress, right? And a lot of people would think that that's an obstacle. But the truth is, every successful person has to deal with a lot of stress every single day. They've just learned how to deal with it in a productive way to where they don't feel those things as stressors anymore. It doesn't mean that the same exact situations doesn't happen to successful people or highly successful people. It just means that they have navigated through those obstacles and learned to turn it into something that's an asset. So you would not be highly successful. You would not have a fully booked client roster if you didn't know how to deal with stress, right? So yeah. by getting by getting stressful situations come to you, you can see that as an opportunity to learn how to retrain the mind. And I just think because it's so common, it's something we all have to deal with. These are all just challenges that we face, whether it's stress, whether it's anxiety, whether it's learning uh, how to structure your diet in a way that's going to support uh, mental health and a positive mood. All of these things I think are positive obstacles or challenges that you can, you, you can learn to master them. You can learn to relate to them in a way that they are going to fuel your success and not be an obstacle in the road. Okay, thanks. Um, now, as far as writing, um, I, I, I see all that you have some, you have a lot of books behind you. Uh, do, do you write every day? Uh, I do write a little bit every day. Yes, definitely. Uh, and yes, I have a ton of books on my bookshelf behind me. Uh, I, I write a lot. Write is, writing is one of the ways that helps me to learn things. Some of the things, I, I will find myself writing them on paper before I've even really clearly thought about them. If I'm thinking about a concept, stuff just comes through in writing. And writing is like an act of clarifying it. Just like speaking to someone helps you maybe figure out what's going on in your head. For me, writing really helps me to figure out a lot of things that are, are going on in my head or come to a new realization about something. 
Okay. And do you, do you write publicly as far as like, do you blog on a regular basis? Do you, you know, put out articles and I do. Um, I do blog. I write for the, for the Epoch Times. I also freelance for other publications periodically. Can, now, if somebody wanted to read uh, your work, you know, just to wh wherever it is, do you, do you have like one place where you link to, to all like these other places where you have your writing? Uh, yes, everything is on my website, which is jayajayamira.com. You can find all of my articles, uh, press mentions, media, everything on there. So where did your, where did your name come from? Is that, that's not actually your name you were born with, right? Jaya Jaya. No, so Myra is my given name. Jaya Jaya Myra is a pen name that I write under, and it was part of a spiritual name that I was given. And Jaya is a Sanskrit word that means victory. And the most often times when you see the word like Jaya Jaya together is in relation to the goddess Durga, who is like a goddess of defeating evil and overcoming obstacles. You know, a lot of this reminds me of, I'm actually, we're, we've been watching this show on Netflix, uh, Lucifer. I don't know if you've seen that. but uh, I have like seen every episode of Lucifer. I, I think it is amazing and fun and totally awesome. Yeah, it's a great show, but yeah, don't tell me what happens because we're probably on nope. like, season three. <laughs> okay, awesome. You'll enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, but there, a lot of that comes up, that, you know, the issues of free will and spirituality and, you know, right and wrong and, uh, you know, it's really interesting, you know, for a police show I and mean, they really take it beyond that. Oh, absolutely. And I think that that's a great way of doing it, you know, really showing people that spirituality, it's really psychological growth and character growth and development because it's about you realizing that you're, you are worthy. You are worthy of anything and everything. You're worthy of your connection with God. So you can't get there without growing psychologically and thinking positively and learning how to overcome obstacles. Yeah. I'll give me one second. I'm just going to check one thing. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to cut this part, but I'm just like, uh, did you want to, was there anything that I haven't talked about that you, did you want to talk specifically about the book or anything else? Uh, th there's one little section in the book, which could be motivational, but it's, it's very spiritually inclined about the direct connections to purpose and your body type and constitution. Oh, that's what I, yeah, I was trying to, there's one more. Yeah. I remember you, you would talk. Yeah. So in your, on your website and, and mm -hmm. I, in the description of your book, you talk about different types, you know, spiritual types and, and exploring and finding about your type. Yep. And can you mm -hmm. tell me more about that? Yeah, we can talk a little bit about that. So the system that I use for people to help to understand their psychological type, their physical body type comes down to the five elements. So you find the five elements, both in Chinese medicine and Ayurveda. Ayurveda normally talks about three doshas, but when you're a practitioner, this gets broken down into five elemental types. So whether it's Ayurveda or Chinese medicine, the elements differ a little bit, but they're five fundamental concepts of reality, earth, water, fire, air, and space that help you to understand your physical body constitution, your psychological temperament, uh, your emotional state, how you're apt to react or respond to things. And this is also how Ayurveda and Chinese medicine help you to understand where your imbalances are so that you can bring those elements back into balance and find health and well being. So the whole crux of the soul of purpose is to teach people that it's your purpose. That's what creates your entire elemental constitution to begin with. And this is something that not many people know. So every facet of you, like literally down to your body shape, your structure, the way you think, the things that you like, the things that you don't like, these were all shaped from your purpose because, because God has made you a blueprint that is 100% aligned to succeed with your reason for being here. This is why I don't think we can underestimate spirituality as being so important for health and well-being, because if you're not living your purpose and you're not staying happy, you're not going to be able to keep your physical health up either. There's so much science now that shows the linkages between purpose and happiness and physical health, how it regulates hormones, how it keeps your microbiome intact and healthy which again, we've already talked about affects your mental health and also how fear and negativity, negativity and anger do the exact opposite. That's going to deplete your microbiome. It's going to throw your hormones out of whack. It's going to increase cortisol, your stress hormone. So we have to keep our emotions happy and stable 
living your purpose is one way and living your purpose also helps you align with your physical body constitution. It's pretty crazy how really connected mind, body and spirit is. But when you dive into it and you realize it, you know that there's nothing that you cannot tackle on your own and that your health and your well-being is totally in your hands and in your control. So, so mental and physical illness might be related to uh, not being aligned with your purpose. It could definitely be because of that. Yes, it could be. I mean, I mean, tangentially in the sense that maybe your body constitution, like mine, I have very strong earth and fire. So if I was eating a diet that was not inclined towards my constitution, it would be throwing my physical and mental health out of balance. D does that make sense? I mean, I would need to yeah. eat in alignment with my constitution, which maybe means, uh, like fire element, I can tolerate spice better than some people. Let's say that someone had a constitution that was primarily water and air element. If they had a lot of spicy foods, their constitution would get thrown out of whack. So they would not be living in alignment with their constitution, which purpose has okay. created. Okay. Yeah, and, and there's way there's ways a person can determine where they fall in that and that like a, a which type they are. Mm -hmm. uh, I do a lot of that work. You can also easily find dosha quizzes online that help you to identify like what your Ayurvedic dosha is. I mean, because this is really what Ayurvedic and Chinese medicine is based around is identifying your unique constitution, what's right for you, what is not right for you, because there's no one size fits all approach to health. Okay. It's, you know, it's interesting is I used to have this handout that I would give to people for things that can help them with pain. And it was a long list of things. And some of them, I didn't know what they were. And through doing this podcast, I've discovered more about them. Like one of them was Reiki. And now I, I got mm -hmm. to meet a Reiki master. And Ayurveda was one that was on the list. And, and until right now, I'd never really had no idea what the word even meant or how to pronounce it. And uh, one of the things you will find fascinating about Ayurveda is they do a pulse diagnosis. So Western allopathic medicine, you know, you, you take a pulse, you feel the pulse. In Ayurveda, they check for three separate pulses, which relate to those three separate doshas. So a story that I find just, just fascinating because it actually happened to me. The first time I, I went to a renowned Ayurvedic physician, all they did was my pulse diagnosis. And then she wrote down a complete medical history of everything that had been wrong with me in my entire life. She got it just from identifying those three pulses and what was wrong with me now and what had been wrong with me in the past. It was fascinating. Oh, well, that's incredible. And, and, and it was accurate also. I mean, she described Completely you. accurate. Completely accurate. Oh, wow. that's incredible. Like, I have not been to an allopathic physician in literally, literally years. Not only did I, I heal myself from fibromyalgia, uh, I also just take care of myself through preventative means and I haven't needed to see a physician. Like my first line of response is to go to an Ayurvedic physician and then if necessary, see an allopathic provider, which is great. If you need surgery, if you need like acute trauma care, there's nothing better than Western medicine, but for preventative or chronic conditions, these are really things that, you know, we, uh, Western medicine needs to uh, up the ante on and learn a little bit more about. Yeah, that's a good point. There's there's things that Western medicine is really good at. Uh, you know, like you say, mm -hmm. trauma and surgery and uh, oh yeah, you know things Amazing. where there's really no other solution. And and then because of that, for some reason, everybody expects doctors to be able to handle everything. That if you have a problem, you go to your doctor. And uh, yeah, you know, there's, and and how can you when ninety percent of it is due to people's lifestyle? What what you need is a lifestyle coach and someone to, to motivate and inspire you to be your best possible self. Yeah, definitely. You know, the, the thing you were talking about, the types, uh, it, I don't know if there's any connection that, um, that I remember there's that book about eat, eat right for your type, but that was more about like, I think blood type connecting to diet. I think that was more about blood type, but that, that definitely aligns with this whole notion that there's no one size fits all approach. So it's very much in alignment with the philosophy that we all have a unique constitution and type. And so if you think about it, earth, water, fire, air, ether, since they shape your body type, they're also going to shape your DNA. They're, they're going to shape everything about you. I'm sure science would have much different words to put around these things where I may say earth, water, and fire. Down the road, science is going to have completely different lingo for the, the same concepts. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's really, really interesting. Now you said that that's maybe one of the most fascinating things you, that, 
that you said that you do not have fibromyalgia anymore. No, I do not. I know doctors don't like to use the word cure because they say there is no cure. But when I did go to see an allopathic provider last time, because I had healed myself many years ago, I never even told her about any history of fibromyalgia. And she had no way of knowing because there is literally no trace. There is no trace of any illness or disease because of the lifestyle I live. And my my alignment with God, with purpose, with spirituality, with knowing that I am worthy and worthwhile. So yeah, and that and I've seen I, I, maybe you've looked at them too. There's discussion groups online, like on Facebook and elsewhere, of groups of fibromyalgia patients, you know, looking for solutions of things they've tried. You know, they've tried different medications and different doctors and therapies. And yeah, uh, I mean, honestly, I I don't tend to go towards. <laughs> a lot of those groups because a lot of people want to own their disease and illness. And I'm like, you can't own your illness and recover from it at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. That, that makes sense. Uh, I, I mean, I, you know, when, when it comes to addiction, I would say it's, I, I agree that I, a person should not be calling themselves an addict ideally and, you know, and identifying so much with their disease, but at the same time, you know, they have to be aware, you know, that maybe yes. long-term, you know, don't, don't touch the alcohol or drugs because, that maybe that could trigger you back to being in that same situation again. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't drink or do drugs. I never have. I, I had two parents that were um, alcohol and drug addicts. That was a choice I made. I chose to never go in that direction. Yeah, yeah. the, the idea of, of free will and making choice, but having limits of what you can choose, it, it always reminds me of um, that movie Taxi Driver, you know, where, where he, uh, Robert De Niro shoots the, uh, the pimp drug dealer guy at the end. And I, I, you saw that movie, right? I think so, yeah. Yeah, it, it was, um, I, I mean, I wasn't like a big fan of it. I mean, I know there's people that are fanatical about it, but I mean, basically in, in the end, he was determined he's gonna shoot somebody. You know, he, he had his gun and he was ready to shoot, but he was planning to shoot a politician. And at the end, for whatever reason, he changed his mind uh, and ended up going into this um, uh, drug dealing house uh, and, and shot this drug dealer pimp guy and he ended up being a hero instead of being a, a criminal for doing exactly the same thing that he was determined to do it was just a matter yeah. of making a different choice uh, but absolutely yes I mean like you know people um, can you know can take what what they have you know the, what they've been given I guess and, and make their their choices and uh, choose between one thing or another and, and just that choice is going to have a, a huge you know, effect on their, on their life in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And, and your elemental type also shapes your unique talents and gifts. So let's say that you are really good at problem solving, right? You could go the way that my dad did and become a criminal and end up in prison for years, or you could use those problem solving skills uh, and adapt them to a career where you're able to leverage those abilities. Maybe you're really good at computers, right? Computer software, computer systems analysis. Do you want to choose to be a hacker and do things that are destructive to people? Or do you want to choose to use those skills for good or be a white hat hacker and do things that are going to be beneficial for people and improving their cybersecurity? The choice is always yours. You've got talents and gifts and skills and you get to choose how to use them. Yeah, that's interesting for um, for me. I, I had always wanted to be a programmer, and I, I kind of have a talent for it. But I mean, that's just extremely uh, an extremely competitive field. But uh, yes, it's something it I always like doing as a as a hobby, and I kind of got lost in trying to you know spending years of you know I, I wanted to publish an app on the App Store, and I you know I wanted to, to write an EMR program, you know, which I'd done all that to some degree, but you know it wasn't really leading anywhere. And, and in the last few years, I've realized that. that writing and, and SEO and marketing, the whole digital marketing field is basically those same skills taken, you know, applied elsewhere, uh, you know, con mm -hmm. constructing, you know, text in a certain way to appeal to a search engine and also appeal to a person at the same time is, is a whole different yeah, kind of programming. Absolutely. And, you know, so mm -hmm. it's interesting absolutely. that you can take a, a skill or something that, that you're really good at or meant to do and, and reapply it somewhere completely different. That's very true. I started by doing a lot of technical writing when I worked as a scientist and I was able to take those skills and turn them into branding and copywriting, kind of just looking at a little bit of the other side of the fence and doing a lot of technical copywriting and things that are highly, highly specialized. So you can always use your skills for something good and you can always develop them 
into something even better that it is going to help you do new things that you maybe would never have dreamed of before. Yeah, I, I would also say that people's experience is probably never wasted, you know, because I sometimes think like, you know, I've wasted years doing this or doing that. But, you know, you can bring it all, it all comes together in the end that you can take what you did during those years, you know, where you felt like you're wasting your time and, you know, it ends up being useful going forward, you know, that you can put yeah. that to use some, some other way. I think you're always able to use your skills when you're working with other people too, or you're motivating or inspiring or, or teaching them a lesson. Like there was a time in my life when I taught Argentine tango and basic ballroom dance. I don't see that as a waste at all. I think that the more things you do, the more experiences that you have, the more full and fulfilled you are. The only thing that you're gonna regret are the things that you don't do. It's typically not the things you do, it's the ones that you choose not to do. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. So, um, oh, I, yeah, I was anyway. Yeah, I'm gonna. I was gonna wind it up, but I, I don't want to pronounce your name. How do you say, guy? Is it Gaia, Gaia, Myra? Uh, Jaya, 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 Myra. Yeah, that's so, fine. Uh, Jaya, Jaya, Myra, Jaya, Jaya, Myra. Thank you for joining me on the rehab podcast. Thank you so much for having me. So, okay, yeah. So, what do you, what do you think? I, I can definitely edit this together. It'd be a good a good episode. Yeah, I, I, I think that this is great. Thank you so much for having me as a guest. You know, these are, these are such important concepts and I love what you were saying about approaching interventions differently. Man, that, that is so, 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 so important. Uh, there is a specific type of puja or rituals that a spiritual tr tradition that I belong to does. And it's all about honoring the God or the goddess within the person. And I've seen people who have had pujas done to them as opposed to you know like where hindus typically like will do a mantra and then they'll give offerings to a statue this is doing it to like a physical person and i've seen that when this is done repeatedly consistently people just change you know when they're forced to like align their own divinity and worthiness like with their life it's just like it changes you psychologically head on and it it's just fascinating, like what can happen when people start to believe that they are worthwhile. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And you don't have to go to that extreme of doing a puja on someone or worship, worshiping them as an aspect of God. But if you think about that concept, it, it's just, it's so powerful and profound. If you look at it from, let's make this person not feel that they're lacking anymore. I think that so much could change. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, in, in Canada, they're doing like incredible, it seems like everything is so much better for addiction in Canada. They, you know, have so many more resources and, and things they're doing. But, uh, but yeah, this guy, um, Harry, Harry Derbisky, who's been on the podcast, uh, he, he's the three principles guy. And he works with um, Na Native Americans who are, uh, you know, who are not indigent people who are, mm -hmm. um, you know, they don't really have anything to any, anybody to help them. And, and they're, you know, dealing with drug addiction, heroin addiction. And he basically sits with them and says, you know, there's nothing wrong with you. You're a perfect spiritual being. And, you know, let's yeah. just work through that. And, uh, you know, I don't know exactly what his process is, but he, you know, they believe in, in getting past, uh, you know, the influence of thought and how thought is the foundation for everything. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's, re it's really interesting. But, yeah, just, uh, you know, but he's not confronting them and, and saying, you know, I'm putting you in jail or I'm kicking you out and taking away your drugs. Yeah. They don't even take yeah. away their drugs in Canada. They, they, they just let them keep using under supervision or give them safer drugs to use until they're ready. Yeah, that, that's a better way of approaching it psychologically, I think, because no one can change something overnight. You need time. It's a process. Uh, there's even science behind this whole idea. It takes 40 days to break a habit. It takes six months of consistently doing something to create a new one consistently as in every day. So I always encourage people have a daily habit form a positive daily habit that's making you happy. That, that's so powerful for changing your mindset right there. And if you can do something that makes you happy and improve your health, you know, that's like a win-win. Yeah. So, yeah, of course, I, the stuff after I said goodbye, we can still use no, it. No, it's, so, uh, it, it's, it's all good. But yeah, I, I definitely appreciate you inviting me on your podcast. It's truly an honor. I will send you a PDF copy of the book. Um, I'd love to hear what you think. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. You know, I meant to ask you for that. And then when I, I don't know why, when I saw 2021, it just seemed so far in the future. I'm like, oh, you probably I know. can't give it out I yet. Know. Um, mm -hmm. I was waiting a little bit to give it out. But now that it's October, I'm starting to like, 
I'm starting to, to give that out to people because to hit the New York Times list, you have to sell all those books in advance of the launch date. So I'm, I'm really hoping like to get a lot of good reviews from people and just get the word out about the book. I'm, I'm just huge on practical solutions for health and well-being that takes mind, body, wellness into account. Oh, uh, so are you, are you open to working with other authors in the future? Yes, definitely. Uh, and especially in terms of, of publicity, I love working with authors uh, because authors need to get the word out about what they're doing and you know they need to get traction for their message. Yeah, yeah definitely. I am I, really good at what I do as a publicist. Like I've gotten glowing reviews from every single client that I have ever had. Like I blow traditional publicists out of the water. Because oh, the person who taught me was a two-time Emmy winning producer for Oprah. So I learned how to think like producers and I'm a writer myself. So I know what writers look for. So I know how to pitch people. Oh yeah. I mean, when I, you know, when I saw your emails, I mean, yeah, they looked, you know, I, I thought I was thinking like, well, you don't, you don't know who, what, what a small little podcast I am. Cause you look like this big, you know, I mean, you are, you're this, this big publicist with these big authors. And I'm like, well, but it, but small, small podcast, it, it doesn't matter. You have a devoted audience and that's better than some of the huge shows sometimes. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, like I've been regular on Harry Connick show. Did that bring, does that bring me business? No, that did not bring me business, but being oh, on wow. podcast with devoted followers. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Being on Harry is going to bring me like website traction and people yeah. on my newsletter, but yeah, that was really impressive it, when I saw the picture of you and him together. Yeah, he that, that was like epic getting to dance with Harry on his show. I'll send you that particular clip. That was if you didn't see the first one, it was hilarious. I will send it to you. Oh, okay. Oh, that sounds good. <laughs> yeah, you'll <laughs> like it. But but yeah, honestly, podcast radio shows. This is really great for authors in particular to get the word out about their books and just to, to get out to people who would like the message. That's why Tara Lynn was so excited because you are exactly in her vertical with what that she's doing, like with her supplement line and uh, with her psychotherapy work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just even beyond the podcast, I mean, I, I ended up talking about it with, with patients and, you know, just kind of keeps, mm -hmm. the word keeps spreading everywhere else also. That's awesome, that's awesome. But yeah, yeah, happy happy to talk to you about anything. I will send potential people your way for your podcast. Always feel free to accept or decline, but I'll send you the people that I'm working with. I try not to spam people with everything. I'm like, if I don't think they're a good fit, I'm probably not gonna send it to you. Okay, yeah, that, that sounds great, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'll send you the book, I'll send you the Harry clip. Is there anything else I can get you? No, that's, that's, that's great. And uh, yeah, I'll let you know as, you know, once I get the, the show edited and, and ready to publish, but uh, yeah, I okay. usually do them on a monthly basis. Although I always, I aim okay. for a weekly, but sometimes they end up being monthly anyways. I understand. If I did not have a producer for my podcast, trust me, nothing would get done. The fact that I can get two episodes out a week is amazing. And and by the way, I'd ha I'm happy to have you as a guest on my podcast. They're short 10 minute episodes. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. I'll send you a link for scheduling and then you can just coordinate with my producer afterwards, like to get her like your photo and bio and all that stuff. We'll, we'll kind of do it the reverse way. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, cool. So I will send you those three things then. And then let me know if there's anything else that you need. Okay, great, great. Thank you. All right. Have a great rest of your day. Okay, you too. Thanks. Goodbye. All right. Bye.